everyone and welcome to this very special one of chat between Beaver Trust and the Mammal Society as part of Mental Health Awareness Week. My name's Sophie, I'm Communications Coordinator for Beaver Trust. And I'm Eva Bishop, Comms Director for Beaver Trust, um, and we're thrilled to welcome Sophie Webb, the Communications and Engagement Officer for Mammal Society and its new chair, Stephanie. Welcome, you guys. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's lovely. Great to have you. Now, this year, the theme for Mental Health Awareness Week is connecting with nature. So we are going to be talking about just why a relationship with the natural world is so important for our well-being and why mammals especially might have the power to live up, lift us out of those sort of dark spaces um, and into a life that's more rich and rewarding and what can we learn from them? How can we, how can we um, connect with them to feel better about ourselves and our sort of communities and all that lovely good stuff? So looking yeah. forward to this conversation very much. Yeah, I'm really excited about this chat. So how about we dive in then? We haven't got very long. Um, and let's perhaps go around the room between all of us and ask the obvious, you know, we're all a little biased, obviously, working for conservation charities. <laughs> um, but does nature influence your mental well-being? And if so, how does that happen? How does that work? Sophie, why don't you kick off? Um, I think for me, especially when I'm out in nature, I can truly switch off. So if I'm in the house or around technology or my phone, I am particularly bad because I go, oh, maybe just one more email or one more text to someone <laughs> or I'll answer, reply this and then and then it'll be done. But I don't really, truly switch off until I throw myself into the outdoors, whether that's through um, like wild swimming, which I know you're a fan of, Sophie, or whether that's um, that I've gone to a new country and I'm in a rainforest and everything is new and exciting then that's when I truly feel at peace and it sounds really obvious and um oh, I forgot the word for it yeah just it sounds an answer that everyone would use but it is true like when you can just turn off and hear the birds tweeting or try and spot what was rustling in the hedges then that's when I'm really happy it's all about that tuning in isn't it it's often the most simple things that work wonders I find Stephanie what about you yeah I'd say it really is the, at the most simple it's the minute you step outside the back door there's something amazing isn't there just about the color green I think it kind <laughs> mm -hmm. of resonates with our yeah. brain differently. and just being out in nature and seeing the color green I'm very lucky to live in the countryside and I have a good friend who's an artist and, and we've stood at the top of my hill and looked down across Gloucestershire many times today and gone, there is something about that, that particular shade of green that says, you know, England in the spring. And, and he's an expat, he lives in, in Australia now. And, and that English green is something that, you know, you strive for in a painting, but you also strive for just to calm your head down and rebalance yeah. everything and say, oh, you know, it, it's all going to be all right. Yeah, I think it's, I think there's a lot of science behind that, actually, the science of colours and how green and blue especially can just be instantly calming. Mm, absolutely. I, I think there is, I think there's something about the, the colours and also the sounds of nature mm. that, are, that are instantly calming on a lot of people. And I think there are there are several um, YouTube channels and places that you can just listen to sounds of the rainforest and sounds of nature or mm. sounds of the dawn chorus that are all very kind of grounding, aren't they? Yeah, totally. Mm. Eva, go. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, I was reflecting before coming on this call about the stark contrast between this May and last May. And for me, um, I think connecting with nature is partly about having time. And last mm. this time last year, I was having enforced time to sit outside. And I have a couple of young children and, and was um, making the most of time with them in nature which really impacted me um, as compared to this May when I am largely glued to my screen um, because we're back in full flow of work the kids are back at school and it's so different and I'm really noticing the difference on my mental health mm. um, so you know I'm, I'm, I'm having to make sure that I find time to go outside in my day rather than it being the majority of what we're doing or you know having sessions based out there so 
Um, I think time is a big thing and you don't even need to necessarily step outside to get that, but you do need to carve out some time where even if it's staring out a window or literally mm. sitting in front of a tree you know, and looking at it, giving mm. yourself time to calm down, nature's a very nice place to do that. Um, switch yeah, off, I, I suppose. Yeah. completely agree. I think there's also something to be said in the monotony of the natural world and like the routine that it has on its own and kind of its rhythms and you know um for example I think I've said this before the um there's a blackbird that comes onto the neighbor's roof at seven o'clock every morning without fail and it just sits there has a little sing song then it goes off and I only noticed this during lockdown when we were having that forced time and then um, I'd sit mm. having my breakfast and I look forward to it every single morning because I was, it was predictable. And at the time when I first noticed it, the world was completely chaotic and unpredictable. And I think it was being able to rely on the fact that that blackbird was going to be there around 7 a.m. That was an immense source of comfort. And then the one morning it wasn't there, I was like, the world's ended. <laughs> <laughs> my blackbird's not there. <laughs> yeah, we have a robin here and I talk to it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, so, um, it's like a little representative of the wider <laughs> yeah. world. And it's like you, you talk to it in a kind of, there's that life. And, oh, you're nature. Hi, Robin. <laughs> you're yeah. still there. That's all right, then. <laughs> I have a similar relationship with a toad that lives underneath my dustbin. Every, every week on bin day, you know, oh, let me give you out the way. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, well, um. Let's talk about access to nature then, because there was a study um, published recently by Cumbria University, which showed that over 60 percent of men and women surveyed s said that they wanted to spend more time in nature as a result of lockdown. And they saw it as important and they felt that it was important to their mental health. And mm. nearly all of them, I think 95 percent agreed that spending time in nature was really important to them. However, there's this access to nature problem. So we know that nature is important to our mental health, but again, this is such a conundrum for conservation. How do we make your local park in the middle of a city seem as nourishing and fulfilling as a wild swim in the sea on a beautiful beach in Devon or Cornwall? How do we cross that hurdle? Um, I read a study recently actually, which found that even with participants in a lab, um, they found that if they were shown pictures or sounds from nature, it had a positive effect on their mental health. So I think it's very um, important to let people know that it's not only that you need to be out in nature, it might mm -hmm. just be seeing it or hearing it that can help your mental mm -hmm. health too. So like you said, with your um, robin and your blackbird, if you're stuck in um, house or block of flats or something, you could put maybe a um, window suction bird feeder up because then you can um, yeah. see or hear the birds that are around you. And I think it's very important um, to um, make sure that you notice the little things. So yeah. that, like if you can see that there is actually nature in the places that you might not think there is nature, that could definitely help. Absolutely. I think that's so important to to not think that to, to, to benefit from nature, you don't have to be walking in a national park. Mm. You can just be, you know, walking in a in the tiniest pocket park in your city and just, you know, stand and appreciate, you know, the bark of a tree or listen to the birds. Yeah. And, and as you say, you know, a small pot of herbs on, on a window still will attract butterflies and, and bees, and you'll start to have that, that interaction with nature that's so important. You know, mm. we, we're not separate from nature and we, we, we think of humans as being separate from nature at our peril, really. We're part of it and, and we need that connection. I think it's important to, it is important to our brains for us to really ground and understand what we are and who we are. Um, that we, we, we need to keep getting out there and having those little, even those little tiny snacks of nature, even if mm. you can't have a whole, whole day out strolling around in the countryside. Yeah, I mean, Eva, mm, you're you're I really agree more. Eva's a real gardener, and she's she's always growing stuff, and she's got all sorts of veggies and things. But I think even the the simplest act of putting a seed in a pot with a bit of compost, 
and just waiting to see what happens. I mean, you can do that on this much of windowsill and it's such a kind of almost childish thing, but, but it, it never fails to captivate, I don't think. And I think we sort of lost It's a really that. important one, actually. Mm. And I think we, when we say, when we talk about connecting with nature, we think of wildlife straight away and we think of other creatures. But um, Satish Kumar recently said, we need more people to touch the soil. And he means it in the literal sense and, mm. and the metaphorical sense, you know, getting out there and get, getting muddy. It's really exciting. But also, I think there are a number of ways of looking at our interaction with nature and mental health particularly can benefit from caring for things sometimes and mm. um since we're sort of talking about mammals today you know that's a nice way that you can from your own uh, from any room you can look to um support sponsor investigate read about you know take an interest in um creatures and their survival and you know all their relationship to humans and there are a number of ways we can interact with nature it doesn't necessarily need to be sitting in the ideal beaver wetland which for me is pretty awesome um, <laughs> it's not accessible it's not available to most people not even me most of the time um, yeah. you know so so there are different ways that one can look at that and therefore you know mental health benefits of nature yeah definitely and going um down the mammal route then um there have been lots of studies that have shown how mammals and their conservation or con that conservation projects are often biased towards mammals um, and there's various reasons for this but an amazing example that's very well known of course is like the giant panda is it ecologically essential in the same sense that like an earthworm is for example or a bird of prey debatable but it receives an awful lot of attention and um, is very much a flagship species for lots of conservation projects and is very important in that sense. But are mammals a good way to engage people positively and is it just something about them um, that gives people feelings of hope and kind of positivity that helps kind of hook in their interests so that then you can um, teach them a bit more about broader conservation initiatives, Sophie, as comms officer. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, actually, um, for me, I think people relate to mammals because it's simply, we are mammals. Like, yeah. we can say about um, gestation periods in these mammals and people can go, oh, wow, well, I carried my child for nine months. And what, this, like, tiny deer carries it for even longer? I think. <laughs> um, so I think when someone can relate to something, they're going to care about it a lot more. And as well, mammals tend to be... Um, mammals tend to be quite big so they're quite easy to spot well compared to maybe a tiny insect or something they're quite easy to spot or to see and to get excited about because sometimes mm. you don't see them all the time so when you do you're like whoa there's there's a roe deer over there like that's amazing um mm. so i think and as well sorry the last point is that some can be very very cute so for example <laughs> your bowl, i'm very bowl biased i know that you guys are very beaver biased but Bowls are incredibly cute to me, and even like their tiny little hands and everything they do for the ecosystem as well. Like, oh, God, yeah. you're cute and really cool. Like, how can you not get excited about this? So, yeah, that's I think because we are mammals, we love mammals. Yeah, I'd say that was absolutely frank, Sophie. <laughs> the cuteness factor, don't you know, don't underestimate the cuteness factor. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's there, isn't it? Because, you know, in the same way that um, we recognise features of a baby, a human baby. They have a slightly big head, they have big eyes. We recognise its helplessness mm. and our need to nurture it. So we, we recognise those same characteristics in baby mammals. And it is very, you know, hardwired into our brains that we need to care for these things. And so I, and that's a great way to get people engaged with conservation. Mm. But here's a really cute mammal that you love. Um, but actually, let's not just think about that flagship species. Let's think about the wider ecosystem that supports it and what we can do. And, you know, but if I go and talk to people about conservation and I say, I want to talk to you about soil, they're not as interested <laughs> as if I yeah. say, you know, let, let's talk about the snow leopard. So. Mm. <laughs> mm. Different audiences, aren't there? And that, that, yeah. that is... <laughs> <laughs> important to bear that in mind um i think younger generations are getting it a little bit more the connectedness mm -hmm. of nature and, and ecosystems and the importance of championing the underbug as well as the mm -hmm. cute 
furry mammals. Um, but it's a really fascinating one, particularly for mental health. You know, it can it can bring a smile to your face just watching mm. some beaver kits play. And that's important. That's enough some days. I mean, when I first... Every day, you know, if I had yeah. beaver here then yeah, <laughs> I'd be fine <laughs> um find them online but, YouTube <laughs> yeah. well, when I saw my first beaver last year um on the river otter the first wild one um you're so right Stefan that you almost you identify so much with their habits and their mannerisms and it was um a lactating mum beaver and she had a few kits and things. And so <laughs> she she had big nipples, big breasts, and she was there on the bank upright, washing away like this. And it was so relatable. And we were all just there <laughs> laughing. And then now <laughs> got this awkward moment every time I shower, right? <laughs> Go through similar motions. And because uh, like, oh, I'm such a beaver, aren't I? Just doing exactly what the mummy beaver did. But um it's it's just those sorts of moments that <laughs> Sort of, we're taught not to, science hates it when we anthropomorphize animals mm. but I do think it's a natural thing to do and I think you know if it's going to get someone interested and in perhaps away from a state of mental anxiety or depression or feeling a bit low and if it's going to lift their spirits um, identifying with these creatures then you know I think you can't get much more powerful engagement than that because it makes it very personal Mm. Sophie and Steph is there, is there um, a mammal you particularly relate to that, and, and used to sort of feel a bit more mindful um, and any that you as Sophie you talked about bulls a little bit earlier what would you recommend to people who are thinking about this the first time want to go and look one up and get it get them you know interested in the creature which one would you recommend well, when you said, um, which one do I relate to, my mind instantly went to wild boar and I was like, yeah, I do eat quite a lot like a pig. So <laughs> then I was like, oh no, in a mental health point. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, normally, yes, of course. Um, oh, that's a really hard question, actually, because um, uh, yeah, no, I do like quite a lot of the mammals, but really, I get really excited about seeing roe deer in my area. I don't know why, but they're always so kind of like perky and they've got, like Steph said earlier, huge, beautiful eyes and like their cute little shiny noses. And the fact that they, like most mammals, can delay implantation and everything. I'm like, um, the, like, a weird fact about them gets me so excited about seeing them. So I know that they can like mate in one year and then have the baby at the end of um, the spring summertime in the next year. And if I can just kind of find a weird fact for any mammal that makes me remember it or get excited about it. And then I can go and see that mammal around my local pond. That is where I am happiest in my mental health state because who doesn't That's have fun. a weird fact? That is what I go for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big believers of that, aren't we, Sophie? <laughs> yeah. um, how, yeah. how about you, Steph? It, it's kind of not so much the the facts and the science it's just getting lost in the moment in the aesthetic and for me it's brown hairs every time mm. so oh nice. lovely mammals. but yeah. um if you if you're out for a walk in the countryside on a spring morning and you see hairs like absolute nutters chasing each other around the fields and jumping up and and boxing and charging <laughs> around leaping in the air you, you cannot possibly hold on to any worry you know mm. it's just gone you, you, you'll have a stupid grin on your face and and you just can't tear yourself away and I think there's something wonderful about that and and, and it kind of leads me to you know we talked earlier about access to, to nature and access to the countryside but one of the very biggest barriers to access is in your own head sometimes mm. you know sometimes if you're feeling really down or you've had a bad day or, you know, I mean, I, I suffer with chronic fatigue and sometimes it's hard to get the energy to get out there and, and do something. But actually, you know what's good for you. You know that getting out in nature, having a walk, getting some fresh air, maybe seeing some wildlife will do you the world of good. And you've got to get past that mental barrier of your own and just get out there and it will be better. It will be worth it. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's a, a lovely way to... 
um, come to our final point, actually, which was um, some top tips for positive mental health for everyone else out there. Um, we thought we'd, we'd whiz around the four of us, um, ways that help people connect to nature and break down those barriers of feeling low or what, or what have you. So, Sophie, Pavel, do you want to go first? Mm -hmm. What are your top um, tips? Top tips. I think um, don't overthink it and don't put yourself under too much pressure to suddenly have a um, miraculous turnaround. I think just to sort of know that it's OK to have rubbish days where you just feel rubbish. But then I think also just trusting in the simplicity of getting outside in some fresh air uh, without your phone and just knowing that that is the most sort of prosaic rudimentary way of sort of balancing things out. Mm, really lovely. I like the leaving technology behind, very sensible. How about you, Steph? Um, I would say, don't think, it, it, don't think in all or nothing terms. If all you've got time for is to stand outside the back door and look at a tree for 30 seconds, do that. It will be it will be worth it. <laughs> That's a lovely one. Yeah, we can all make time for that, can't we? Absolutely. How about you, Sophie? Um, for me, it's actually noticing the little things. So it's slightly like steps, but if I can go outside and just anything as small as an ant or a fly or anything goes past, I'm like, oh, you know, that was a bit of nature. Like that can bring my mind back, make me think, oh, okay, I can stop going into my head and into my own thoughts. Like just notice the little things and then you can go from there to get clearer thoughts and then go on and seize your day. Really nice mindfulness noticing of uh, little things. I like Either. that. Well, I'll add a last one, which is a little bit more specific actually, um, which is about connecting to other people to talk about nature. And you look mm -hmm. at the smiles on all our faces. It's been really fun to talk about it. And whether that's making, you know, suggesting a nature club at school or I do a gardening club on a, every once a week and you just have a half an hour just chatting in nature with other people, it can really lift spirits because then you're mm. sort of combining that community as well as being in nature. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we sort of sign off, Sophie and Steph, is there anything that you'd like to promote or shout out about the work you're doing um, at the moment or what you've got coming up this week? Oh, well, one, one thing I would suggest is that people could download our Mammal Mapper app. So we have an app that you can, you can download free to your phone, it's free to you. And when you're going out for a walk, you can just set it and, um, and note down if you see a mammal anywhere. It can be anything, it can be a rabbit, a grey squirrel, a common as you like we're not just after the rare sightings but that data will then come back to us and we'll use it in pulling together some of our distribution maps some of our occupancy modeling uh, and learning more about you know where mammals are doing well and not so well in the countryside and using that to inform conservation work so it's a tiny little thing it's free to use and you'd be contributing to conservation i suppose we'll also, definitely do that yeah i suppose also if, if you <laughs> do idea. need to if you do need to go out without your phone, um, you know, in many ways, using an app like the Mammal Mapper can be mindful in its own way because you're sort of on a hunch, you're focused, you're on a mission to, to see what you can find. Um, exactly. And then you've got the satisfaction of feeling a little bit empowered and sort of valuable to science by contributing data. So that's um, different yes, side of the coin. On that one thing rather than yeah. on, you know, kind of all your other notifications. Or indeed, yeah. if you want to leave your phone behind, you can fill in the sightings when you get back. You just have to okay. remember exactly where you were and where you saw things. But yeah, <laughs> either way. Nice. Very nice. How about us, Sophie? Um, well, <laughs> Quick we've, plug. We've, uh, we've got various things going out this week on social media, just promoting mental health awareness and... Um, all sorts of beavery stuff and season two of the Lodgecast is well underway of recording so we're excited to get that out soon and we're going to be talking to um, a guest who is a doctor in a couple of weeks about uh, the green prescriptions and prescribing nature for for health and well-being overall and how that works in the medical sense so that's really exciting. Yeah. Wonderful oh. that's been very nice to talk to you both. Yeah, all thank you today thanks for the time yeah <laughs> and um whoever's watching make sure you follow mammal society and keep up to date with all that 
they're doing and their mammal map app. It's really exciting. And um, oh yeah, if you want to tell us uh, how you're spending your mental health awareness week and how you spend time in nature, um, do let us know. Tag Mammal Society and Beaver Trust and use the hashtag connecting with nature because that is the theme for Mental Health Awareness Week this year. <laughs>